I'm Chris from Play Comics, a show where we look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material, a part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other astonishingly geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. This is the official GunnaGeek.com show. Each week, we run down the latest news and happenings in the world of geek. These are your hosts for the show, Steven, Chris, and SP. Welcome to episode 395 of the official Gonna Geek Show. I am Steven, and with me, of course, is Chris Farrell. Good evening, everyone. We've also got with us SP. <laughs> Almost caught you there. Hey, I'm the only one without an on-air sign on. I, I need an on-air sign. Christmas is coming up, guys. Why don't you send one my way? The the world is always on air when you're around. I see. I don't it's know. Just that just makes sense. But <laughs> I'm, what was what was that with uh, with the the dome and the reality show and everything under the but dome? The Truman, Sh- the Truman Show. Oh, We're not Truman on air show. anymore, guys. I took us off the air. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Time to go home. Thanks Wait, for joining us. We're all home. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you didn't know this, we are the official Gunna Geek Show, and we like to talk about geek stuff. And we are a monthly show now because, hey, check out the most recent episode if you want all of the details to do with that. But we're part of the Gunna Geek Network. We want to do the show once a month to come together, talk about some highlights that we find in the geeky community over the past month, some latest news, some other things. It just depends on where it goes. In the new year, we will have a more set schedule but uh hey towards the end of the show we'll talk a little bit about what december might look like but uh no specifics yet but you can have that little tease there if you didn't know this the gunna geek network has a bunch of awesome geeky shows you should check them all out at gunna geek.com check them out lots of awesome shows including some new additions and some returnees i heard there's a show that talks about podcasting called better podcasting there's a really cool American guy, and then he's got some hack of a co-host. Don't know what his deal is, but uh, yeah, you should check that out at gunnageek.com. I called myself a hack. Oh my. I guess I, mean, I guess I should let you guys know I'm making one called Adequate Podcasting. That's my new show, <laughs> where we just skate by with the bare minimum to be entertaining. What about Just Okay Podcasting? I like that. Yeah, That's good. That, one, that, that one's okay. Sets the bar low. <laughs> I mean, I, we could go on for a while here. I mean, it took Stephen and I, what was it, like three weeks to finally come up with a name for better podcast. If, if we like set that. the bar low, then when we exceed expectations, it's a good thing. If we set the bar too high, then you'll never exceed expectations. <laughs> oh, I've got an idea. Okay, let's let's roll with this. Welcome to episode 395 of the official Gonna Geek show where you will have mediocre conversation semi-related to geeky topics. How's that? That's like my life. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's laying it out how it is, so why don't we do it? All right, well, let's go ahead and move on to the news. Not to be confused with Chris's nudes. It's going to take me a while to break that habit of calling this the news segment because it's, it's kind of news. It's, it's topical conversation related to geekery over the last month, really. But that doesn't really fit on a, on a, like a segment intro. So uh, we'll come up with a better name. However, I'm going to start us off by talking about matter. Now, what is matter? Well, matter is a thing and it matters. That's a very good descriptor, don't you think? Yes. I think so. I mean, it's going to matter to talk about matter. It will. All right. So let's back up here. You might have actually heard us many, many moons ago on the Gunna Geek Show talk about matter. I know if you were in our Discord server for any length of time, you probably saw me chat about matter as well. This is something that we've been following for a while. You might actually have heard the name Project Choip or Project Chip because they had a really weird original name. The idea was that for the smart home world, a bunch of big companies would come together in order to create a standard 
where things could talk to each other and everybody that mattered uh -huh. would actually go ahead and use this so that you didn't have as much division between the different ecosystems for smart home stuff. And this is what matter is. Well, what do you know? In usual official Gunna Geek Show fashion, we record an episode of the Gunna Geek Show and something really big comes out immediately the next day. That was the case with Matter. After we recorded the most recent episode the next day on October 4th, Matter version 1.0 spec was officially published, meaning it was open for business. Now, Matter is something that a lot of big players have been involved. Now, when I say a lot of big players, I mean it. If you go to the site and you look it up, you can see a huge list of partners that have been involved. But from the beginning, big, big names. You had Apple, you had Google. Samsung, uh, you had, uh, as I say, Amazon, Amazon, you, you had a bunch of big players that were in the smart home business. Also, things like the parent company of Philips Hue, you had Tuya, which is, is the backbone to many inexpensive Wi-Fi based smart devices out there. You have a huge amount of players that for a long time have been working on this project. So it was a matter of finding out when it was actually going to basically come out because at that point it was all talk and a lot of question marks came out. But yes, as of October 4th, it is officially released. There have been in the recent months, several big names that have, have pushed us closer to seeing their, their implementation of rolling this out into their hardware. Big highlights include the Samsung smart things. I believe that's actually officially out now. It was one of the earliest ones that were certified. So they did get the software out. Q bridges have been certified with the update on the firmware coming in um, the first uh, quarter of next year. The Aquara Zigbee stuff, which is pretty inexpensive Zigbee based stuff, they plan for December 2022. Brilliant lighting is 2023. Eve sensors say December 12th. And these are just a few of the, the players in the smart home nitty gritty that have dates or rough dates put to their products. But you have other companies that that haven't given firm dates like Amazon, like Google, like Apple that are saying it, it is to come. It's just we're waiting on those specific dates. So this is all really exciting because this is and again, to overuse this term, this is what matters with matter, because if you have a spec that everybody's going to use, it means nothing until you see the practical implementation come out and what it's going to mean to the end user. And once we start to see these things come out, that's what we're going to see. Hue's going to be a huge one. Hue has a lot of different functions within their different light bulbs and how that translates to being passed over matter to another platform is going to show us a first glance of what this is going to look like for the end user. Now, one of the things that, you, that I want to mention with matter is matter itself is, is the way that these smart devices talk to each other. It's basically how they are communicating with each other. It's not the method of communication, though. And what I mean by that is they are talking to each other over that, but they might they, they have the ability to use matter on Wi-Fi networks or what's called thread networks. Thread thread is a type of wireless signal that is is recently been building up within people's houses. There's a bunch of different project products that will create thread networks. And the matter standard is meant to work on both Wi-Fi and thread. So there's a bit of confusion happening with this right now as far as Wi-Fi or thread. Do I need a thread network? Well, it's all really going to come down to what devices we see come to fruition with matter and what they run on. Like, let's say a light bulb is made and the light bulb runs on Wi-Fi. I don't care how robust of a thread network you have. You're going to need to use the Wi-Fi. Reverse. If all of a sudden a light switch is built to run on thread and you got a fantastic Wi-Fi network, but you got no thread network, can't use that. So this is something we're going to have to see how that takes off. Thread will probably, I think, become the prominent one, but it'll really, I think, depend on the end user as far as, uh, as what the implementation is. Because if all of a sudden most of the mainstream people don't have a thread network, well, then obviously the people selling these products are going to want to get their products in the consumer's hands, and maybe they'll lean more towards the Wi-Fi implementation of Matter. 
Now, the last thing I want to mention before I turn it over to you guys to discuss this a little bit is as it currently stands, they've said that matter to, to get it up and running, you need some form of matter bridge. Now, br matter bridges are going to be built into different things. The big examples that have been used to date is that when Amazon, when Google, when Apple get their implementation worked out, the odds are that a lot of their devices that are a little more powerful will act as that matter bridge. The big theories being things like the Amazon Echoes or the Google uh, or Nest Homes or the um, Apple, whatever it's called, Pod, HomePod, I think. Th that's the theories of, of things that might act as a matter bridge. Now, there'll probably be other bridges as well. And I believe that the Hue bridge is an example of that, where in theory, it should be a, a, a matter bridge. But these are the things that I think we're going to need to see. Where does this bridge portion come into play with matter? Because if you're going to create a platform that requires an extra piece of hardware, well, we've seen that in smart homes today. There's a reason why there's a lot of limitations with the things that you go and you buy at Costco that connect to your Wi-Fi. There's a lot of limitations compared to going and building yourself a robust Zigbee network. But a lot of people don't do that because they want to just be easy and use what they've got. And a Wi-Fi device connected to their phone is easy. So if we don't see a bunch of these matter bridges come out, I think that's going to be problematic. But I do think we're going to see that, that come out because a lot of people who do smart homes and stuff, they do have voice assistance. And if it's baked right in, then it becomes a non-issue. You might say it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm done for now. So what are your so thoughts just, on matter being out? Both of you, go ahead. Does this mean that I won't get text messages from all the smart bulbs in my house asking for the Wi-Fi password? No, I think that's still going to matter. Dang. What's your I, thoughts, I guess I have a different perspective is I do everything through a hub right now for the most part when it comes to my bulbs and stuff like that. Most everything goes through my smart things hub. But I think I have a few things that don't like I think I have a, a Wi-Fi switch that's just through Amazon voice services, things like that. So I'm curious once everything starts working, once we get to this interconnected nature and it's coming soon. I, in fact, I think I'd read some stuff on either Android Central or elsewhere where routines and things created in your smart things app were now starting to show up in the Google Home app and things like that because of how they started bridging things over. That's when we get to that point where it's, hey, all these devices that have six different apps to control, in theory, I can control it through my app of preference, be it the SmartThings app, be it the Google Home app, be it the Amazon A Word app, because you can control devices manually through the app itself, not just through voice. That's going to be what's nice, especially when you've got things that don't play nice with all of those. Now, I've kind of gone out of my way, and most of the things I've bought play nice with both digital assistants so that I can get it to work, but not always. And I do have some stuff planned, excuse me, specifically, I can't remember the name of the manufacturer, but I know I talked about it in our Discord. There's a company that makes a humidity temperature motion sensor that is HomeKit only. I yeah. think it's Eve might be yeah. the name of the company that is HomeKit only. And while I could set up HomeKit, I've never done it because I didn't see the point to set up for no devices that were going to use it. So my plan is eventually, once everything is actually connecting as it should, I want to get this thing that's only supposed to work HomeKit and then tie it all in via matter and thread and things like that. I'm not worried about thread connections in my house. I'm covered there. I have enough Amazon and Google devices that support it. And my mesh Wi-Fi supports thread also and will be updated to work as edge routers. So I'll have a robust thread network in my house, which will realistically help me extend the reach of some things, whether my hub could actually reach it before. In fact, I recently moved my smart things hub into my basement office as I was moving around some stuff. And I was curious whether it meant I'd lose signal to some parts of my house. I haven't. So maybe that's not a problem, but it'll be interesting as I further extend my footprint to see whether matter and thread implementation helps me spread my footprint without having to have my hub centrally located. As we go forward and we see all of these additional matter devices, these bridges, these threads, in your homes, in your apartments. And that's what I'm going to key in on. Dense urban environments. There's just going to be so much throwing around that you're going to end up with interferences on the fringes of your networks. 
And it's only going to be because all these things are talking to each other that it can reach the nearest proper authorized signal to enter into your network, whatever that network is. So it's the thread, the bridges, the Wi-Fi network, whatever. If it can communicate to something and connect to something, then that's what's going to save the people in dense urban environments as these devices become more prevalent going forward. Yeah, and I think that will be interesting to see because like I, I said in my blah, blah, blahing there, the uh, the technical term, I believe, is, is what that's called. Uh, thread, I think, is where they want to go with matter, even though technically it does support Wi-Fi as well. But because they kind of are leaning towards thread, I'm curious to see how that does play because that that is a legitimate problem with people who have a bunch of Wi-Fi devices and so do their neighbors. Like, that, that is a problem that comes up, and I'd like to see how this all plays out um, with Thread. Now, the thing that I, I'm i really excited about is that actually SmartThings is one of the first ones that that is like a core ecosystem being worked into Matter. Now, I am no longer a SmartThings user, but I, I was a SmartThings user, and I still recommend it to lots of people who wanted to do something a little more advanced with, with their smart home, but not get too complex like Home Assistant. I think it was a great balance, and they did the right balance of, of going, okay, we started out being just a Zigbee and Z-Wave type bridge, but we need to go beyond that, and they started to do a lot of direct internet-based integrations as well. Like They, they were smart. They did a good balance that with that. They actually drew back the whole Zigbee area. Are degree. you saying they did smart things? They did smart things for smart things. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> and now it matters because, hi, Dylan, uh, because they have th this system that people built a whole bunch of things around. And that's just going to feed right into matter, like you said, in, into Google and stuff. So it, it's easy for users. So I, I like it. I think that that's a really good place to have started out with people who are semi- complex with with their smart homes and i'm excited especially because i know both of you have smart things hubs not only do i have a smart things hub but i have a smart thing enabled samsung refrigerator i also have a samsung main tv in my great room and they all talk to each other like if the refrigerator door is open that notification pops up on the tv all because it's within the same network i didn't turn it on that was <laughs> nothing that i did it just one day the refrigerator door was open and it started beeping because I can hear it. It's, it's an open floor plan, right? But it popped up on the TV and like, okay, if I was somebody somewhere else in the house and the refrigerator was open, it would inform me on the movie or the sports event that I was watching TV or whatever. So I'd go to the kitchen, shut the door. I think it's pretty cool. Plus notification comes up on my smart things app on my phone. So if I'm out of the house, I, I know like if I'm on my way to work and it's open, I'm like, oh, great. So, you know, turn around, come back and close the refrigerator door so it's not open all day. So yes, those integrations exist within smart things. But the bonus with matter is it's not just smart things. It's all matter connected devices, which is one last thing that I want to touch on before we go away. That's the area that I look forward to seeing because they, the initial initial release notes do seem to indicate it's not full functionality at launch, that there will be some limitations. I've seen a couple of references to that, and I'll, I'll be curious to see, number one, what sort of things do uh, decide to get removed, and how long does it take to get those things in? Because if you got somebody like, I'll use Philips Hue as an example, Philips Hue does a lot of things. If all of a sudden I'm finding myself being able to do a lot more with you, with the Hue app direct, am I going to go there or am I going to go to my Google Home, which is limited? It might depend on the situation, but I'm probably more likely to go to the more advanced area if I'm doing those things. So, so it'll be interesting to see. I want to say one last thing. I know we were spending a lot of time on here, but this is not new. This type of system wired though has existed on boats for a while the nmea backbone system mm. has been around since like 2000 so it's been around for 
22 years. And it's how all these navigation systems and these communication systems can link up on the same backbone. So you can have the information flowing between devices all over the boat. You can steer your boat from the cockpit or from the nav station inside or from wherever, like multiple cockpits. If you happen to have a boat with uh, multiple levels, you can steer it from on top or uh, on the rear end if you're uh, docking or whatever. Anyway, that is all possibly because you have that backbone. What we're getting now is that backbone in our homes through wireless devices. What I really am looking forward to is the next version, which then will support things outside of just light bulbs and smart mm -hmm. home devices, but actually start supporting things like cameras and other stuff like that, because matter was not originally designed for that. But you've seen people talking about it seems like a logical extension for us to look at that next. And if we could do something that makes it easy for me to control all my cameras through one app, because while I wish I had all, say, Nest cameras, for instance, that's a bit cost prohibitive. So I have some wise cameras that are hooked up for security, and it's annoying having to bounce between apps to view them, although you can at least pull them up on smart displays since they all play nice that way. Well, we'd lo love to know what your thoughts are with Matter. Are you excited about this? Do you have a smart home? Because we do have in our chat, because we do stream live at Geeks.Live when we record, we have Albert Sims saying, my house is still dumber than a bag of hammers. Well, I will tell you that hammers can be smart. They can. They can. Because, well, I, I just figure so, because every time I swing one, it's mine just says, no, don't go there and hit, hit your thumb instead. That's not me doing that. That's the hammer smart. Maybe you're subconsciously smashing your thumb. <laughs> Maybe. Do you enjoy <laughs> pain, Stephen? I do. I love it. I mean, no, I don't. Mm. <laughs> uh, come to uh, gunnageek.com slash discord to chat more about your pain. I mean, about matter. All right, moving on to the next news point. We got some cavil chaos going on and lots of people who are crushed. It's actually true. There's a lot of people that were crushed about this, but this news came up on about October 30th, right before Halloween. But it surprised the heck out of everyone because it just kind of got announced on Instagram. But uh, Henry Cavill, at the end of season three of Netflix's The Witcher, will be leaving the role. And the show will go on. He's being recast with, um, oh my gosh, I'm having a brain fart. Liam Hemsworth, not Chris Hemsworth that you're used to seeing dressed up with hammers and medieval-like weapons. But Liam Hemsworth is replacing Henry Cavill, which... I guess that's okay. It's just very confusing, though, because if you've paid attention to the media blitz when the Witcher series first started, Henry Cavill was talking about his deep appreciation for the source material. The author of the Witcher books talked about that pretty much as he sees it, Henry Cavill is the live embodiment of Gerald of Rivia. And Henry Cavill had also chimed in about how much he loved the games on top of these things. He'd mentioned in interviews saying, quote, I'm really enjoying playing these kind of games and reading these kind of books in my spare time. For me, it is more like an extraordinary opportunity to live my childhood and adult life fantasies. That's why everyone's kind of going, whoa, what, what, what's going on here? Why is this happening? So there's a couple thoughts as to why it may be happening. And I guess we're going to have to get into a very minor spoiler for the Black Adam movie, which has been out, what, three weeks? We're past our spoiler window, right, fellas? I, I'm good. I'm, I, think, I think we can go ahead and see it. Okay, so... For those that are unaware, in fact, Henry Cavill announced on Instagram, and so did Dwayne The Rock Johnson after the fact, Superman is returning to whatever version of the DC universe we have out there for movies. Henry Cavill appears as Superman in the post credit scene of Black Adam with the spit curl a la Christopher Reeve and the music a la John Williams. And they have pretty much said, hey, we want to do something with Henry Cavill and Superman again. And as you know, a superhero role is a big time commitment on top of a time commitment for playing Geralt of Rivia. So one thought is maybe Henry Cavill's responsibilities and going back as Superman is going to make it so he doesn't have time to do it. And that's why he's stepping aside. There's another theory going around and this, this has kind of picked up some traction in the rumor sites. Nothing's been confirmed yet is that supposedly the writers and producers for the Witcher series have started veering a bit more away from the source material, and Henry Cavill was a big proponent of said source material, would provide notes on scripts and dialogue based off of what it was in the books and the games, to kind of steer them back towards it, and didn't particularly care for the changes they were making to a character in a world that he greatly enjoyed. So that's the other rumor, is that he may be stepping back because 
He's just not happy with the creative direction the show is going. Regardless, it is a shame because he is fantastic as Geralt of Rivia. He's really, really good. Part of it is because of how much he throws himself into that role, I think. And Liam Hemsworth's okay, but he's not Henry Cavill. He's not going to bring eyes to this show. There's not going to be people like, oh my God, I'm going to watch The Witcher because Liam Hemsworth is in it, where we had people that went to go see it because Henry Cavill is. And I'm not saying this jokingly. There is a certain segment of the population that just started watching it because like, hey, Henry Cavill's really attractive. I want to see him in this and then kept watching the show after that because they started to like it. I mean, that's not to say Liam Hemsworth is an unattractive man, but I, I don't think he ranks as high on the people lists or things like that as we see with Henry Cavill for being the draw to bring people in. So more what I'm getting at is the disappointment a lot of fans have expressed who may have started out that way coming in because Henry Cavill was good eye candy is more of, oh, well, now my eye candy's gone. I'm not really sure if, if that's enough to keep me with this show while I'm enjoying it. Everything's going to change. I don't know what you keep on saying. Liam has eye candy. He's dated some he's hot Henry women. Cavill. I mean, he's good enough. What season look, of the show is look, this? Let me put it this way. Henry Cavill in Mission Impossible, when he cocks his arms to go fight, almost made me question my sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> sorry, sorry. When he, when he, what? What did you say? When he cocks his arms in that okay. fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like you got what you wanted out of that. <laughs> I mean, uh, kidding aside, I, I just feel like it's a downgrade to the character. Let, let's take the superficialness out of it. Maybe I shouldn't have introduced that. I was just trying to break with the special <laughs> point I'd seen other people talk to. Is that this would be like going from say Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark, Iron Man to Someone who's not nearly as quantifiable as a star. I realized as I started this analogy, I didn't have the name to go with. <laughs> like, who, who are you going to go with? Who are you going to say? I mean, come on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you backed yourself in a corner there. But I, did, I, 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 I will in say the this, though, because my wife watches this show, and, and I, I, I never really... Really gave it a this show. She watches Kinda not Geek? this show. No, hell no. Oh, okay. Uh, no, she, <laughs> she watches The Witcher, and um, I, I have to say that uh, I, I've seen a couple episodes of it. Just I, I actually wanted to go back and, and watch the whole thing, but um, when she heard this news, she was very disappointed, and and her words were, "Yeah, uh, it was something to the effect of, yeah, I heard he's not going to be that character, or you know, uh, no, it was it was yeah." Liam Hemsworth, okay, or something to that effect is, is what it was. She was very dismissive about it, just on name alone. My wife's answer, and allow me to censor here, is F that, I'm not watching that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Liam's got some guns on his own. I mean, give him a chance. So I think part of it is how often do we have a television show where they recast the lead role? And don't tell me Doctor Who, because that's built into the show for them to be able to Bat do that. Woman. And how well did Batwoman succeed? Um, post well, I mean, that's... but that wasn't a character change. That was a that was a that's character also change, true. not yeah. not a actor replacement. Now that these sort of things do happen um, from time to time, I don't think a, a major thing like this happens that often. I think though that um, there is. A, I'm going to comment on. I'm going back to it. I think there is a stark visual difference, which which does play into a character like this. Like I think. I think there is a certain presence commanded by physical nature, uh, and this could be anything. This could this could be a strong physique. This could be a weak physique, and and that can play into the character. Like there's a reason they cast for things. There is a reason people do things to their body physically for parts, whether it's gaining weight, losing weight, doing weight with lifting, because it's there to play the part. And these two people are very physically different. I mean, he can bulk up, I'm sure, Liam Hemsworth. He, I mean, we've seen what his his family line can do when they want to bulk up. I mean, we've seen how jacked his brother got for Thor. He's Hell probably no! got, <laughs> you flicked too hard. He's probably got the same potential to get as jacked as his brother. And his brother has like an insane workout regimen he could share with him, I'm sure. Because we do know Henry Cavill went insane for his workout regimen. He was more jacked as Geralt than he was as Kal-El of Krypton. Like, that's the level of effort mm -hmm. he put into it. It's like I said, though, the hard thing here is this is taking the main character who the show was built around, who the show was marketed around and being like, uh, we're subbing someone else in. Congrats. And 
I'm not saying Liam Hemsworth is going to be bad in it, but he's in a terrible position because there's so many people that watch this show because they liked Henry Cavill in the role. And now it's, oh, Henry Cavill's not in it. You've got to do something really big to hook them to be like, I'm going to come back and watch this when he's gone. All right. All right. It's so this is not like Marvel where you have Thunderbolt Ross pass away and then you cast probably one of the biggest actors of the modern age in that role. Right. So, I mean, you don't have that gravitas. You can't with the type of character that Henry Cavill plays. So you go for what you can. And, you know, a lot of people might be saying, well, let's just cancel the show. Let's cancel the series. But then you got to think of all of the people who depend on the series, even if it's just for one more year. It gives them one more year of experience, one more year to catch a gig somewhere else and that sort of thing. So, okay, it might not be everybody's favorite, but this sort of thing is going to happen over and over again as we go forward and people just flip and say, no, I'm just not going to do this anymore because we have seen that. I mean, deaths are one thing, but also I think Hollywood is going to get more and more, especially with streaming shows of people leaving and then you're left holding the bag. What do you do? Do you do a AI version of the character or do you recast? I think recasting is more honest. So, uh, Albert Sims had brought up a couple good ones in the chat room. Gold ones, Bewitched, Mrs. Kravitz, and Darren. We did have two different Darrens on Bewitched, but yeah. I would argue the circumstances are slightly similar because that was more centered around Samantha than Darren. There were co-leads, I guess, is the way of putting it. Whereas Henry Cavill is the lead of the right. show. So I, I think it'll be interesting in that regard. I don't know. I, I guess we could be arguing this in a different way as had they decided to recast T'Challa in the Black Panther movies, that'd probably be a different conversation we're having. All right. All right. I got one for Steven. Last man standing. I would also make it's the same argument. It's secondary character. It's not like it, you could spin you know, it as but, James Bond, but I would argue that James Bond kind yeah, of treats it similarly no, but, to Doctor yeah. Who, which is, hey, winking a nod, it changes every few years. I, I will go back to Last Man Standing. And and, and bef- the thing that that is important to make, I think, the correlation between the two examples is that this series is established. Last Man Standing was established. And it was jarring. It's different if it's early on. Like, I still maintain that for Batwoman, they should have recast the main character. With all of this conversation, it was only one season they had with the original actress, Ruby Rose. And I think that even though we got really good storylines out of it, I think they could have achieved similar pivoting with storytelling by keeping the same things that they had built and just shifting the storytelling in a similar manner that they did with Batwoman season two, but just recast. And that would have, I think, been a lot better because it was season one. And the reason why I'll tell you this is because your last man example example, SP, they did a bunch of recasting after season one of Last Man Standing that no one ever talks about because that happened in season one. And, And with this series here, we're very well established. So I think it's more jarring in that case. All I know is that I'm so glad that that this project, the Witcher project, is only limited to TV and there's no video game stuff or anything like that that has to be considered. Yeah, just real quick aside, because I know we're short for time. We went over. <laughs> the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt next gen upgrade is finally coming out. Uh, CD Projekt Red had promised it originally last year, but I guess because of other delays and things like that, December 14th, they'll be dropping the free update for the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. So if you have a digital copy of the game right now or a copy of it whatsoever, it'll be a free upgrade for Xbox Series devices and PlayStation 5 devices, including things like ray tracing, new DLC to tie in with the Netflix TV show, stuff like that. And side note, if it's been something you wanted to play, this game goes on sale all the time. I think I bought the Game of the Year edition with all the DLC for like 10 bucks on sale on an Xbox sale two years ago. And now I'll get a free upgrade to it. And I hadn't gotten around to playing it, in part because once I got the new console, they said, hey, the next gen upgrade's coming. I went, I'm waiting for that. And then it kept getting delayed. Is this going to get us Liam's voice? Is there a DLC for that? No, they already have. There's a different voice actor that plays Geralt in the games. And in fact, Henry Cavill has gone in death before in interviews of how he decided to do his own voice and not follow the voice model that was in the game, despite him really liking the game one. Again, this is how (laughs) in-depth this man got with the source material on Witcher. It's like he was debating whether he mimics the voice of the game, does his own thing or something like that. I, I will point it out that Star Trek Elite Force back in the day, the first version, 
came with a different voice doing Seven of Nine. That's but true. in the expansion pack, you got Jerry Ryan. So it could still happen. It could still happen. So, Chris, just to answer your question that you asked and failed before, Robert Downey Jr. replaced by Tom Cruise. But I don't think that's an apt description because they're both like no superstar actors. In fact, I would argue it's the opposite. I would say that that's moving well, on up. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with based off their current statures in the business. But if we had replaced, say, Robert Downey Jr. after Iron Man 2 with Tom Cruise. Fair probably. enough. Fair Robert Downey Jr.'s career was a resurgence after the Iron Man 1 and 2, basically. And he was in everything. All right. Well, thanks for filling us in on that. And we look forward to you giving us your full review when you get to watch the next season with Liam Hemsworth. You're going to give us the full review on the show, right? I don't think we're watching it in my house. My wife has like <laughs> no interest in it. <laughs> it'll be banned. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be banned, but it's just, I don't know if I'm going to go out of my way to watch it necessarily if she doesn't want to. You know what we're going to do? There's other stuff we'll watch together. SP and I will get a message and, and Chris will be like, I'm sleeping on the couch. What did you do? I watched The Witcher. <laughs> <laughs> all right well moving on to the next news point here artemis one uh you had a bit of an update because you talked about this the last episode and it was supposed to all be taken care of uh immediately after the last episode so it it, it should just be a, a, a post-mortem right right before we go on <laughs> i have to make a big disclaimer <laughs> i have never watched the watcher or the witcher or played the video game okay so all that conversation that I just had was just for fun. All right, Artemis 1. Yes, everything's fine. It made its flight and it's on its way. Wait, no. Okay. So <laughs> last time on Gonna Geek 394, uh, a little over a month ago, I told you that Artemis 1 was scheduled for launch dates between November 12th through the 27th, something in there of 2022. Today, as we record this, it is Monday, November 14th, 2022, and Artemis 1 is set to launch in less than two days at 1 a.m. on November 16th, 2022 for its first launch window. Uh, my work, as of this morning, already expects me to either be late in that day or not come in at all. They expect not to hear from me for a while, so that's good. Okay, how did we get from our last podcast of what was going on with Artemis to right now? Artemis 1 spent the remainder of October 2022 in the Vehicle Assembly Building, or the VAB, or VAB as it's called at Kennedy Space Center. The stack, that is what is called the SLS and the Orion, known collectively as Artemis 1 with the launch platform, so that is known as the stack. The stack was rolled back out to launch pad LC-39B on Friday, November 4th for a launch attempt at midnight on 14 November 2022. Unfortunately, Hurricane Nicole came out of nowhere, and I can debate that, and I probably could successfully debate that, but I'm just going to go with this. It came out of nowhere. Even people in Florida will say it came out of nowhere and hit the eastern coast of Florida right smack dab at Kennedy Space Center the night of November 9th, 2022. Hurricane hit the Kennedy Space Center. Well, what happened to Artemis 1? Due to the abruptness of the storm, NASA was unable to roll the stack back to the vehicle assembly building because the winds during the time that it would be transported would be above acceptable safety limits. So they were stuck there on the launch pad. Now, if it was going to be a higher level hurricane, like a Cat 2, 3, 4, something like that, I think they would have chanced it. But they didn't want to chance it because it was only forecast to be a Cat 1 hurricane, which was within limits. And also, they weren't sure of the track. So they were thinking maybe the track will go farther to the south or farther to the north. At the time they made the decision, that's what the track was. It was going to go well to the south. So the winds would have been less. Yes, they would have gotten thunderstorms, lightning, possible tornadoes, which would have been bad, and definitely surges. But I think it would have been OK overall. The chances of any of that happening were relatively small. Cat one hurricane smack dab into the space coast. All right. And that happened the night of November 9th, 2022. And again, they did not have time to roll it back within safety limits. So they had to stick it out on the pad within limits during the hurricane. This rocket going to the moon withstood a hurricane. That's pretty cool. Now, 
NASA did cancel the 14 November launch date and then pushed back two days to its backup date of 16 November instead. Instead of being midnight, it's going to be 1 a.m. Eastern on November 16th. Now, on Saturday, November 12th, NASA held a press conference after inspecting Artemis 1 post-Hurricane Nicole and announced they were a go for Wednesday morning, November 16th launch. And by the way, just before we recorded this, there was another news conference that I didn't get all the details from, but the first thing that they said is we are still a go for 1 a.m. on Wednesday, the 16th of November. There were a few noted items, such as a loose RTV. Yes, that same RTV that you might use on any caulking thing that you use around the house. They were using it on the rocket. And the Hurricane loosened some around the flight termination system, which is attached to the Orion capsule on top of the stack. So there was some loose RTV. There was an electrical connection at the base of the launch tower that needed to be replaced. It was replaced. And from what I saw on the news conference right before we recorded, it apparently is functioning within nominal bounds. So I think they're good to go there. And there was an engine cover that blew off down below. I forget which engine it was. It might have even been engine three for all I know. But the engine cover blew off. They inspected it. Water didn't damage it. So they replaced the engine cover and that was it. And it was blown off. I don't know if it was like blown off, like they found it or like blown away by the hurricane. I'm not sure. It was all assessed to be fixable before the November 16th launch. And I think what I heard right before we recorded this is that the teleconference, the news teleconference they had said good to go. So where are we? What's the current status? As we record, the launch team has been called to stations a few hours ago, and the 48-hour pre-launch countdown is ongoing. There is yet a still unknown issue. If the fueling system is resolved from what was scrubbed before or not, they still don't know that. So there is a chance this all could be scrubbed Wednesday morning, and we'll see if that happens. I'm not going to make a prediction there because... I, they could have changed the procedures, which will prevent the system for super pressurizing and hammering that connection, which apparently is what happened to begin with and caused some secondary issues. Now, if the mission does launch on Wednesday and it is successful, the mission duration is planned for 25 days, 11 hours and 36 minutes with a splashdown on December 11th, 2022. And if that goes well, and if everything goes to plan for Artemis 2, which is under construction right now, I think the main RS-25 engines are being mated to the core right now. It's scheduled to launch sometime in 2024. I've seen May 2024, and it includes a 10-day crewed flyby mission of the moon. There is no crew assigned to that mission yet. I think we're a few months from the crew from being assigned. I know that they have select that NASA has selected astronauts in the Artemis program, but nobody's been assigned crews yet. And then if that is successful, then the Artemis 3 mission, which will land on the moon, pending whatever's going on with Starship. And that is supposed to happen sometime in 2025. So that is the timeline as it stands today. And also, I've got a note on Starship. But you guys, what do you think about Artemis 1 going off here on Wednesday? I look forward to flipping a coin after as well myself. <laughs> look, I'm just glad the weather issues didn't become much of an issue because we were chatting about it for a while. Like, oh, man, this keeps changing what they think is going to happen. Man, if I'm the person that has to make this decision, I'm probably needing to change a pair of pants change my pair of pants right now because I'm freaking out. <laughs> the launch director, Charlie Blackwell, she has been very gracious during this whole time. She's been isolated from the press a little bit because I think she might say some things that might not be warranted. But yeah, she, I mean, if you're the launch director for this thing, it's like, oh, I just want to get this thing to launch. I can't believe that this is happening right now. So there's that aspect of it. And you have higher ups in NASA, which are uh, protecting them. Also, this is a very, very public launch. And all this stuff happens to rockets all the time. And we're just seeing it happen, play out real time, because this is the first major mission back to the moon in over 50 years. So there is a lot going on there. Yeah, it will be interesting to see what happens if it goes to. I, I have question marks on 
on the whole situation with all of its history. Um, and I, I think also the future of the program. Um, I'll leave it at that. I, I, I have questions about that. Let's back up on that a little <laughs> bit and let's revisit Starship. So Starship is being constructed right now and developed in Boca Chica, Texas at Starbase USA. Today, they lit off. There's 33 engines in the main stage. They lit off for 7.33 seconds, 14 of the 33 engine, which is a pretty hefty lift. Literally, it's a lot of force. If they light off six more engines, it will be the biggest thrust of any SpaceX rocket to date. If they light off all 33, it's going to be the biggest rocket ever. So I think they're, they have to do a static fire of all 33 before they go ahead. They did take Starship 24 off. They took Ship 24 off and moved it away from the pad. And then also of note, after the 14 engine static fire today, there was no literal dumpster fire and there was no fire of the <laughs> surrounding area. Darn. That's always a highlight. Always a highlight. You're right. All right. Well, really quick before we talk about uh, Twitter. Hey, there was a bit of a sad news this this past week. And uh, Chris, I think I'll turn it over to you because you're the one that was I, I, I you have a lot of history here and are very passionate about. So we'll just start it off by saying F cancer, just as Stephen Amell has said before. But for those that are unaware, we lost arguably the definitive voice of Batman to many a generation, a man who had voiced the role for 30 years, 400 different projects between video games, television show episodes, movies, all sorts of content. Kevin Conroy passed away just a few days ago. For those that are unfamiliar, like I mentioned, he'd been the voice of Batman since Batman, the animated series. He was longtime voice actor. Before that, he'd been an actor, gone, I believe, to Juilliard. He was Robin Williams' roommate at one point in time in New York City. The man had a story, amazing career, honestly. And for many fans, I know that if you read a Batman book, it's his voice you hear in your head. Kevin Conroy playing Batman. And I will say, for those that don't think voice acting is on par with regular acting, well, number one, you're wrong. Number two, go watch what is arguably the best Batman movie ever, which is animated called Batman Mask of the Phantasm. And there is a scene there where Kevin Conroy pivots back and forth between basically being Bruce and Batman. And you can hear heartbreak in his voice when he's telling his parents graves that he didn't expect to be happy. And he's not sure whether he can go forward being Batman because he's found love and he's happy. And the heartbreak and the way that Kevin Conroy portrayed it it is amazing. If you want to just see that, it's available on YouTube. But it is arguably one of the best Batman movies out there. But we did, in fact, lose Kevin Conroy. I guess you can find small comfort or comfort, I guess, in the fact that his role is going to live on forever. His work lives on forever. No one's going to forget what he's done because he's generations of people's Batman. And I don't see that media ever going away. And whoever has to become the go-to voice for Batman in games and cartoons and stuff like that now, they have a mighty big cape to fill. And it's going to be very hard to do. I agree. And, you know, I, I was someone like yourself that had the animated series, right? Grew up with this sort of thing and, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, you, you hear that voice. Um, I don't, I'm not sure why. I, I just know that you have a tighter connection with, with that in your memory banks than I. I personally do, um, but I, I hear that. Uh, definitely iconic, 100% agree. And I, I just have to say, I, I want to give a weird acknowledgement here, was as the Arrowverse started to do come under its complete demise, uh, we got Crisis on Infinite Earth, and Kevin Conroy got an appearance in there that, that a lot of people criticized because it turns out that, that he was playing an evil Batman for his, his cameo. I have to say, when when you look back and you look at how the Arrowverse just completely collapsed afterwards, there there was no opportunity to ever see him in it again with, with the way the Arrowverse collapsed. It just would never have happened, even if we got a great version of, of him as true Batman in there. We have all of this history of, of him as the voice of Batman. I am actually really happy they went that way for Crisis on screen with him playing a, a really different take on Batman because I don't think anything would have lived up to what everybody ha had put up in their minds 
by having him as the voice for so long. I think that that looking back on everything, seeing him play this this different version in that cameo, I think that's that is the the better call and the right call that they made, and I'm happy we have that. Glad you mentioned that because I was going to mention it as well. I know Chris, you and I, we podcasted about the crisis over on the podcast Starling Tribune when we were still doing that. We ended it after Arrow ended, which was shortly after Crisis, so we didn't uh, continue on with that show. But I got to see and hear Kevin Conroy for the first time because I didn't watch any of these cartoon animation superhero things in the 1990s. And this was my first experience to him. You guys talked him up. His performance was great for what it was. And I'm glad I got to see that. Now, during my research over on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. for X-Men the Animated Series, I was trying to find the big overall of Fox Kids. I was trying to find Margaret Lesh somewhere. Turns out about a year ago, there was a Stay Tuned, and Tuned is spelled T-O-O-N-E-D, movie that was put out called Presents BTAS for Batman the Animated Series, full movie. I can give you the link if you text me or or message me or whatever. It's on YouTube, so you can search for it yourself. Stay Tuned Presents BTAS, full movie. Kevin has a lot of time in there, but what's really cool about it is even though he's talking about his experience and what it meant to him and what it meant to all the fans and stuff like that, he gave credit where credit was due and talked about the entire staff and the other actors that made that whole thing possible. And it really endeared me that he was so gracious as the star of something like that to really give spread credit around and say it wasn't just all me, it was everybody. And it was the writers, it was the content, it was the backing of Fox Kids. So I will always remember him for that as well. And it's it's like two and a half hours. It's not just a, a short or anything. It's a full documentary movie. Like I said, came out about a year ago. So that is my memory of Kevin Conroy not having seen any of his animation stuff that he did in the 90s. And DC did make a digital version of DC Pride number one for free because that's a story that Kevin Conroy wrote about finding Batman, how he found his voice with it. And pretty much that's when he announced publicly to the world that he was a proud gay man. And that's available free for folks to read right now. And there's a really another cool tribute if you get a chance. Um, I believe it's a documentary called I Know That Voice. Mm. And they were doing an interview with Kevin Conroy where he's talking about post 9-11. He was working in like a soup kitchen, whatever, and trying to get food to relief workers. He's back in the kitchen and he'd been working there a few days. And one of the guys he was talking to was like, hey, I'm an architect. What is it you do? And he goes, oh, I, I do voiceover work. I do cartoon voices and stuff like that. And he goes, oh, I knew it. You're Batman, aren't you? Uh-huh. So like the guy goes out there and goes, Hey guys, you'll never believe it. Batman's cooking our food back here. And of course it's New York. So someone chimes into the effect. Oh, bull expletive. (laughs) And so I guess Kevin Conroy talks. Yeah. (laughs) And then prove it. And he, I guess he talks about the fact that then he launches into the, I am vengeance. I am the night. I am Batman and drops that whole line there. And people are like, Holy expletive. It is Batman. (laughs) And he was like, I just thought it was really neat that I could do something like that. And it brought a smile to those people's faces. That's cool. He was very aware of how resonant this role was with his fans and people out there. And he will be missed. For sure. So if you want to chime in some thoughts about Kevin Conroy, you should come to our Discord server at gunnageek.com slash Discord. Because there's a lot of people who have been talking about this in our TV and film channel over the last uh, little bit. And uh, we'd love to have your thoughts over there, too. Now, the last thing that we want to talk about right now, we got to acknowledge it. It would it would be we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about it. And it is the Twitter. We'll call it a meltdown or t- we'll call kerfuffle. it twi- Twitter kerfuffle, Twitter trouble. We'll call <laughs> we'll call it the t- Twitter stuff that's happened. Is that is that even I don't know. So here's the summary. Gonna ride. Here's the summary. If you didn't know this last year or this year. Elon Musk decided he was going to go out and buy Twitter for $44 billion. And, and there was a whole legal kerfuffle that happened around that. There was uh, tried to get backed out of that, ended up going through with that. And upon becoming a private entity with Twitter, uh, immediately we started to see changes happen on Twitter. A bunch of layoffs were immediately happened. Uh, lots of important names exited. I'll say exited because there are some big names. It's gray whether they, they left or they were made to leave. 
Uh, and then there were some changes that have rapidly happened over the last few weeks since Elon has has owned Twitter. And uh, one example being that verification. If you didn't know this Twitter verification before, the little verification check mark. Long time there has been controversy around the Twitter verification. Hard to get. It was completely closed off for a while. Well, they opened it up to Twitter Blue users paid. Uh, Twitter Blue in itself had a bunch of um, things that rapidly changed with that. But the, the change in the verification process, meaning that people could just go and verify. Oh, did I say people? I meant iOS users could go and get themselves verified through Twitter Blue because it wasn't iOS. Wait, wait. Are you saying I'm not a person because I have an iOS device? <laughs> a limited section of people who only had iOS were able to get Twitter Blue and thus be verified. Is that but Steven, you? that eight bucks is going to prevent anyone from being a bad actor, right? <laughs> that's enough of a cost that no one's going to want to mess around. I'm so glad you brought it up because that's what happened was all of a sudden for eight bucks a month. Uh, there was a bunch of spoof accounts that came out that had the little verification check mark, including uh, parodies of of Elon and his various entities like SpaceX and Tesla. That's what happened. Twitter just blew up with a bunch of uh, we'll call them parody, but I, I'll call them troll sites. A bunch of troll accounts were verified, and this caused a bunch of people to get confused and laugh a little bit. About it also them. caused some big companies to lose a lot of money due to those. And it did tying it back to what we discussed with Kevin Conroy. Like Twitter for me has become a place when something breaks news wise, you can generally find it there first, mm -hmm. and you would look for the blue check mark in most cases be able to know if it's coming from a legitimate source. When Kevin Conroy died, I didn't know if it was real or some kind of BS gag because I couldn't tell going through Twitter via a search because there were so many people that showed up with blue check marks. And I guess if you click on the check mark, it'll tell you whether it's a Twitter blue verification mm -hmm. versus a regular verification, which why we didn't make them two different colors to make it easier. I don't know. Well, I'm, but it, I'm glad you mentioned that, by the way, yeah. because there was a rapid evolution over the day of rollout. So continue. Yeah. It just made it so that I was I get I let folks know in our discord stuff like, hey, this is being said on there. I don't know if it's true and I don't know the right way to find out other than just waiting to mm -hmm. see whether a publication picks it up because those that were picking it up were saying it was from reports on Twitter. And I was like, we're all going back to that source of not knowing because the verification mess that went on. I will give you another example that happened on Saturday, just two days ago. There was a very, very, very unfortunate aviation incident yes. in Dallas, yeah. Fort Worth, where a P-83 fighter jet from World War II vintage collided with a B-17, and both aircraft were total losses, and I didn't know if the footage was real or fake. I didn't know if it was old or new because I don't remember hearing about or seeing this incident before. For those that don't know, I know a thing or two about aviation. So I was looking for verification and I had to actually go to the local Dallas news in order to get verification. And unfortunately, most of the Dallas news outlets were using these Twitter videos as reports. So I had to wait until one actually got some confirmation. That is a real world tragedy that occurred that affected the entire area of Dallas because a highway was shut down because that's where the aircraft landed or crashed. And uh, there was loss of life during the incident as well. Significant loss of life. So yes, this, this is not just a joke. This is something that we were using for verification of reward events, and it didn't work on Saturday. And uh, the thing that I, I think is important to mention while we're talking about this whole verification thing is that these sort of steps, like Chris, you, you went and you said, hey, I can't verify this. I can't I can't verify it. This might be true. You, SP, going and trying to search, search uh, Dallas papers and stuff. These are things that people should be doing to try to verify things before they pass them along, but they don't. And unfortunately, the way Twitter has been so tight with their verification things for so long, it has been a sort of a go to that some people expect if they see that check mark that, you know, this is this is some form of reputable source. Mm -hmm. Now, now that's how they designed it. Yeah. Reputable. I'm going to leave a lot of room to discuss what that means, because I, I, I think that that's an important note while we're talking about some of the places that have been verified. 
but we'll leave it on the surface there as that. Um, but this this joke verification was pretty funny in some of the cases. Like there there was uh, an official quote unquote Nintendo account, not actually, with Mario flipping the bird. There was a whole bunch of other random things, but there were there were actually big stock of uh, impacts to some companies because of some of the some things that came out to do with this as well that negatively impacted the companies. So, you know, this is an adjustment, obviously, that's going to have to happen. They did put pause on that right now because of the backlash. But the thing is, this wasn't unpredictable. This is something a lot of people were 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 guessing about and anticipating when the idea of paid for verification came out long before it was even implemented like this. This was completely foreseeable. And to me, that's the part that I look at it is this wasn't a surprise. Everybody was saying, oh, somebody's going to troll it. Somebody's going to do it. How, how like all of these things could happen. And because people theorized it, it's why it happened so quick, because people said, you do this, I'm going to troll you. <laughs> I just don't understand why so many people felt like they need to have the blue check mark for internet clout, for lack of a better term. Because <laughs> honestly, th there was a point in my life when I was doing a lot crap load more podcasts and stuff like that. I was like, hey, it'd be kind of cool to be verified. Mm -hmm. Wasn't going to happen. I didn't have the audience for it. But I never was of the mind of, oh, I'm going to pay eight bucks so I can have a blue check mark. But it's just a vanity check mark. You're not being verified because you're a source or an authoritative voice on some field you're, you're paying for it which is why i really kind of don't know why they just didn't do two different check marks one for like those public entities and things like that that should be verified for notification and those who want to have their vanity check mark well i i'm gonna say like yeah i wanted to be verified at one point i thought that it was cool that we knew cody goff being verified still is but, for now but here's the thing that's because it was like to me i think that's because it was like this coveted thing because it was limited. Now that you're paying, like if so, somebody who before was like, hey, yeah, I'd love to be verified. Cool. Made all the sense in the world to me. Now you're, if, if you're paying for Twitter blue just to get the verification check mark, I, I'd like to know what is your reason for that? It's not to declare you're real. That's that we've proven that. It's not to declare you're real. It's not to get something that nobody, that a limited segment of po the population can get. Because anybody can pay eight bucks. So, so what is the reason? What, what is it? Is it as simple as you just want a little badge? Or is it because you are, you are thinking in the way of four weeks ago when it was coveted? And I think that a lot of people probably fall into that right now. And I think you might see some of these people pay the eight bucks for it, go, hey, look. And then they're going to drop off because they're going to go, wait a minute, and anybody can get it. There's nothing, nothing special about this. But I do want to quickly talk about a couple other random things that came up with Twitter as well. People found that dev versions, uh, dev versions were being run of Twitter. Uh, today, allegedly, 2FA is broken because the microservice has been shut down. And also, there's been... Supposedly, it's back, but okay. maybe not for texting okay. your code. And then there's unfounded reports uh, or unverified reports of problems and services of people who have been trash-talking Elon. Normally, we wouldn't throw that out there, but I do want to throw an interesting thing out there. I've been vocal. I think that Elon's been making poor decisions and I've been voicing that on Twitter. That's my opinion on it. But I noticed that with my account where I was uh, saying my gripes, trashing, uh, that, that, uh, that the first tweet that I had was an ad. If I went into any of the other accounts like Gunna Geek, Better Podcasting, even other old accounts that I had kicking around, None of them had the first tweet as an ad. And I also refreshed and I refreshed and I refreshed and I did this cycle. And consistently, my main account had it at the very top. And during that refresh process, I would get more lag than the other ones. Now, there could be a thousand other reasons why. And I want to say that right now. It could be due to account activity. It could be due to busyness. It could be other things. But the fact that I saw that on the heels of some of these comments, maybe, maybe not. It'd be interesting to know. But I just think that that Twitter, the Twitter ride is going to be an interesting thing to watch for a while. If you like to watch crazy things happen. <laughs> I don't know. That's my thoughts. You know, some people obviously probably have no, no care in the world over it, but, um, yeah, it seems like things are going to fly hot. Changes are going to be fast and there's going to be a lot of fast fails.
So regardless of your personal opinions and decisions being made, it's fascinating to watch all these changes happening in real time and the reactions to them. It's interesting. And the fact that he's listening a little bit, like he's responding to some... He's responding to people, but I don't know that he's listening. Mm. Okay, well, okay, fair. So he's (laughs) responding to some people and... He is making changes because the masses want it and and the his trolls. vision. And I, I don't know about his team and what their opinion is. And here's my thinking going into this whole thing. It was almost too big to fail because he paid, what, $44 billion yeah. for this Way thing? Yeah, overpaid. Yeah, right. True. Very very true, but he paid $44 billion. So I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be way too big to fail. And yet he's been tearing it apart going along the way. I'm like, Twitter has just been a mainstay. No, this can't go away. I'm not so sure of that anymore. And like you guys are saying, that this is now entertaining to me. There's going to be some day that I'm going to go in and log into my Twitter account. And it's just not going to be there. It's, so, it, it's going to happen. Yeah. One of the things that's going to be a problem for them is the attrition of staff. And what was it? He's gone in there and, and roughly fired. Is that what fired we're calling it? Attrition? Layoffs. He's fired, what, about 50% of the company is what it comes down to. And by yeah. most people who report in the business sector of things, when you fire a segment of a company, about half of that amount you fire is then probably going to quit after that because they see the writing on the wall. Right. So in theory, if it follows that general measure, 75% of the company could be gone. Now we can argue that Twitter was probably bloated staff wise. But that's a lot of in-house knowledge that's gone that you've got to backfill. And we already yeah. know that they kind of went, oh, crap, after the initial round of firings because they started asking people to come back and they gave them 10 minutes to decide whether they wanted to come back, evidently, when they called with those offers. And most of them told them to shove it up their butt is my understanding from what I've been reading. Because <laughs> if they fired you once, why would they keep you after the fact? So that's going to be their biggest problem is attrition of staff and in-house knowledge. And it may not be a big deal to us as we record this show, but coming up is the World Cup. The World Cup is going to be a very Twitter heavy experience for millions of people around the world that are watching games, tweeting their favorite hashtags, following for World Cup updates and things like that. That is going to be a very interesting thing to see as that kicks off what here in a few weeks, how the new Twitter or the new staff at Twitter is able to handle just getting hammered with requests and things like that during the World Cup. Yeah, that will be interesting to see. I think we've already seen some some of the cracks come here because of of the lack of staff. I, I think probably the two FA is a great example of it. If if that happened earlier today, that there's probably somebody who was responsible for that that had that on a checklist that isn't with the company anymore, right? Like the, these are the sort of things that will come out when you have such like bloated staff or not. I agree. I think that's a very valid point that probably Twitter was bloated and. Whether it was or not, there was a process or processes in place that incorporated that bloat. And so that means that more random tasks were probably with different people. And so now that all has to shake out. I'm really interested to see what happens here. I think that um, it's not going to go the way that any of us originally anticipated when he bought it. And I, I will, for me, I will not be surprised if at some point, this gets sold off of his plate at a loss. Like I, I, that's sort of where my mind goes right now because there's a lot of people invested in that $44 billion. And at some point, if, if enough changes happen and enough money comes out of the business, at some point, I feel like the investors push to, to take a, a big loss now as opposed to a bigger loss later. And that's where I, I think that, that maybe later it just logs it to someone else. And I, I don't know what that person would do with that or that company. I I was thinking that is the case and it still might be, but I, I think too much of Tesla is wrapped up in this. Exactly. Mm. He's leveraged a lot of Tesla stock is my understanding to be able to make this happen. So well, that's so going to be a problem. The other Tesla's interesting thing is Elon is the CEO of three companies and he's arguably working on all three companies. When do those other companies be like, hey, Either we're not getting the attention we deserve or you're bringing the wrong kind of attention to our companies by what you're doing here. What happens then? Say yeah. six months from now, we're still mucking, mucking, or mucking around Excuse me, with Twitter. What happens at Tesla there? We know they've got ongoing issues with full self-driving, upcoming lawsuits, the National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration's after them for stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on. And 
one CEO or a CEO in one company would have a hard time keeping up. A CEO that's trying to lead three companies. How are you going to do that? He's got a team at all three companies. He's got not only the staff of the companies, but he's got his own team there. Yeah, I, I had also read that like even in SpaceX that there was behind the scenes a handoff happening sort of thing as he went over to Twitter. So though if you want some real lulls before it all stops being funny, uh, go to Reddit slash R slash real Twitter accounts. And this <laughs> is where you can find all the memes and stuff from the fake accounts that are out there from things like at Pepico talking about how Coke is better than Pepsi and stuff like that. Verified <laughs> at Pepico. To address your SpaceX concerns, it actually makes corporate sense for the changes that they made because they are transitioning launch operations, eventually assuming that Starship is going to be successful from Boca Chica to Kennedy Space Center. Mm. So they took somebody from Boca Chica that was in charge of the spaceport there and then plopped them over at Kennedy Space Center. You still have the development happening in Texas so it, the three people or uh, five people that I think I've seen involved didn't really change what they were doing too much. They just restructured the company a little bit in order to enhance and move forward. That's what happened there. That's convenient. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we'd love to know what's your thoughts on this. Come to our Discord at gunnageek.com slash Discord. And uh, hey, just a little shout out there. Uh, Chris and I randomly before really before the blow up, like it was it was at the beginning stages of it. We, we both independently happened to just be like, hey, let's check out a couple other random social social networks out there. Uh, Chris tried counter social. I tried Mastodon running my own Mastodon instance called Moostodon. <laughs> and apparently a lot of people seem to like that. And um, and honestly, it was it was mostly an experiment for me. And I failed my own experiment because too many people saw my Mustadon instance and interacted with me. And that's not what I wanted because Mastodon, I've got a lot of a, a lot of concerns about it and the discoverability and things like that. Um, and when everybody when, when the founder of Mastodon tweets, well, tweets, I mean, toots your toots, toots your toots, your toot. Uh, then what happens is you got a lot of people interacting with you and, and that just broke my whole test. So Chris tried to reassure me offline. That that means that I I actually succeeded at failing, but I just I think I just failed all around. It's like Apollo thirteen is <laughs> a successful failure. So I, I also signed up for cohost.org, but I've been waiting to get my account approved for the last <laughs> week and a half. So evidently I'm still three thousand deep in their queue. I was seven thousand deep about three days ago. So they're having a bit of a slow rollout on that and. Who knows? Also, a lot of people, I guess, are going back to Tumblr, but I never really got Tumblr, so I haven't mm. played with that any. Well, I mean, they're allowing the adult content back on Tumblr they? because they were losing so much money. So, well, thanks, everybody, for checking out the Gonna Geek show. We will have one in December, so you should definitely uh, keep an eye on uh, Twitter.com slash Gonna Geek if we're there or Discord or Gonna Geek.com slash Discord <laughs> or come on over to Facebook.com slash gonna geek because we will announce the official recording date for that soon it'll be earlier in december like we always tend to do because most of us try to trail off a little bit towards the end of december for our podcast stuff so we will definitely um try to record our december episode earlier in the month so please keep an eye out for that and hey if you also want to come and tweet chris you can do so but what you should do is you should actually start another account called Chris Farrell and Farrell and get verified. That's what you should do. go for it, man. <laughs> I think I said jokingly at one point in time, I didn't really care if someone parodied my account because that would be funny to me. Now, if you're going to do it, be funny about it. Don't try and say like racist things or things like that. Just make dumb jokes. But L yeah, like Chris, he just absolutely, absolutely loves all things to do with the Arrowverse. He said there wasn't a bad minute of television in the See? Arrowverse. And that would be funny to me. I would be <laughs> tickled and entertained by the fact that someone went through the effort to do something like that to kind of rip me a little bit. Also, that's that's fine. You know what? Someone should create a Stargate Pioneer account and talk all about how much they love the Suicide Squad. Which one? There's two of them. <laughs> oh, Chris, by the way, I heard that you bought Pitt season tickets for football and basketball. <laughs> 
<laughs> Actually, there are a lot of West Virginia fans that bought season tickets because it's the only way they could get tickets to the backyard brawl in Pittsburgh this year. And it's like 60 bucks for season tickets at Pitt because they suck. So for episode 395 of the official Guinea Geek Show, I'm Stephen John Drew saying that's the type of trolling you got to do to Chris on Twitter. I'm Chris, and I say eat expletive pit. I'm not allowed to say that word on this show. I'm SP saying, here's hoping, Artemis. Here's hoping. Maybe there should be an Artemis parody account. I think there there is. is. (laughs) Hi! Thanks for checking out another episode of the official GunnaGeek.com show. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review in Apple Podcasts or a thumbs up on YouTube.